I would like to talk about the British-born uh, filmmaker John Borman. Deliverance, of course, his most well-known film. And Zardo is a film uh, completely mocked uh, by most of the people today who may think or not they know what is a good film. And Excalibur. These movies are uh, epic, poetic, uh, visionary, sometimes, um, you know, uh, seem a bit uh, dated, uh, um, coming from the mad imagination of uh, its uh, filmmaker from the 70s. But John Bowman is a quite a unique film director, and uh, my first advice, if you don't know very well his, his uh, body of work, is to read his excellent um, memories. The book is called uh, Adventures of a Suburban Boy. Um, this is not just uh, memories about uh, filmmaking, it's a personal uh, comment about uh, John Borman's uh, life, uh, United Kingdom after World War II, and uh, the creative complex process of filmmaking. to start of course with uh, Point Blank. Um, it's a film which still uh, after more than 40 years is uh, remarkable visually. The acting of Lee Marvin um, is probably giving a hell of performance of his career. But the movie gives us um, from a foreigner, uh, British um, you know, point of view of um, America and especially two cities, San Francisco and Los Angeles. Point Blank, Point Blank is a mega classic, of course, and uh, the next film I really recommend uh, is uh, a masterpiece, underrated uh, film, Leo the Last. Leo the Last was shot in London with a brilliant cast. You have uh, Marcello Mastrioni, the, the great um, Italian actor um, who is uh, playing uh, an aristocrat back in uh, Notting Hill. And um, 
suffering of some kind of um, uh, nervous breakdown and um, you know um, passionate by birds and uh, discover his neighbors uh, who are um, you know fresh um, immigrant um, the film is, is really a brilliant uh, satire of uh, high society class uh, system and a strong political poetic statement of uh, UK in 1970. Leo, played by uh, Marcello Mastrioni, eventually discovers that his lazier life has been supported by rents from the slum that surrounds him. He is mortified and attempts to give his house and money to the people of the street. With predictably disastrous results, we wanted to imply that we are all Leo's leaving off the poor of the world. Behind uh, this very generous uh, social um, you know, critic of uh, society, especially in England uh, in 1970, John Broman explained moreover that um, in the air you know, at that time was the belief that we were on the verge of a breakthrough, that film could evolve into something transcendent. So we see um, um, a film like Point Blank or Leo the Last uh, came in a, in a key moment in the film production uh, and uh, could allow more artistic creative freedom from director's perspective to express uh, their fantasies, obsession. We've met before, I believe. Off the frame. Come now. My brutal friends call me Zardoz. <laughs> Revenge! Zardoz is a film uh, which has um, bad reputation. You can just uh, check on the internet. You may have uh, hundreds of uh, self-improvised film critics who are going to tell you and try to convince you this is one of the worst um, stupid ever directed science fiction film. I personally uh, disagree. I think it's a film much more interesting than we may think. And the best uh, way to understand this very complex uh, dystopian science fiction, epic, poetic, uh, passionate, and sometimes uh, clumsy uh, John Berman personal film, is to read The Memories of John Berman. The film was an extension of the theme of Leo the Last. The rich exploiting the poor, we the people of the developed world, are extending our lifespan through advanced medicine. While the majority of the world is getting poorer and more abject, I wanted to project this tendency into a future where immortality had been achieved. How will this elite protect itself from the huddled masses? Living in Ireland, the answer was all around me. The Catholic Church had controlled and oppressed a nation in a way that England had been unable to achieve true force of arms. So my elite would invent a religion. Zardoz speaks to you, his chosen ones. have been raised up from brutality to kill the brutals who multiply and our legion. To this end, Zardoz, your god, gave you the gift of the god. 
The gun is good. The gun is good. The penis is evil. <laughs> If people are immortal, then reproduction is unnecessary, indeed undesirable. In such circumstance, does the sexual drive survive or atrophy? I devise categories. I imagine how different temperaments will respond to endless life, the apathics who had lost interest in living, the renegades who wanted to die. Crimes were punished by Arjane, by one, five or ten years, depending on the seriousness of the misdemeanor. Consequently, the renegades were mostly ancient, whilst the Eternals were perpetually youthful. There were, of course, no children. Outside this idyllic commune, the vortex lay the outlands peopled by the Brutos. Zed was a Brutal of great physical and mental prowess. He discovers that the god who rules them, Zardos, is a version of the Wizard of Oz. A, traf a trafing stone head that flies across the outlands and commands the lives. This trick has been devised by Arthur Frayne, a Merlin surrogate. Zed uncovers this elaborate conspiracy and penetrates the vortex to wreak revenge on his masters. Zed's objective is to destroy a place which he believes has become a perversion of nature and of life. In death, there is beginning. Death approaches. We are all mortal again. Now we can say yes to death, but never again, no. Now we must make our farewells to each other, to the sun and moon, trees and sky, earth and rock, the landscape of our long waking dream. Zed, the liberator, liberate me now according to your promise. Do it. Zed eventually destroys the vortex, giving the immortals the gift of death. He survives with child rampling, and they have a child together. The final sequence is done in a single shot with a fixed camera. It tracks at the end to the handprint on the wall of the empty cave, like the cave painting of primitive men in Lascaux, suggesting that this future world could have been in the past, and that has that civilization ended, or began. Where are you, Merlin? If only you could see me, wield Excalibur, once more.
in the land of dreams. Are you just a dream, Merlin? A dream to some. A nightmare to others! Merlin! Uh, a few key to understand um, the very ambitious poetic lyric um, take uh, of John Borman on uh, Excalibur is in uh, Memories. John Borman explained during the preparation of the film, I began to formulate the idea that the Grail cycle was a metaphor for the past, present, and future of humanity. In the early chapters, the Hither Pendragon period, man is emerging. He still has an unconscious magical connection with nature, both in its violence and its harmony that could be said to represent the deep past. What if Merlin were to summon Excalibur from the lake? The sword will focus the chaotic and conscious forces that lie beneath the surface. It could then give it to Huther, who would abuse it. Violence and anarchy reign. Merlin would arrange that the sword passed to Hüther's son, Hathir, and its power allows him to impose his rule and make peace. As law and reason are imposed, Hathir gradually forfeits its connection with nature. Camelot is established, a place of learning and science and order. Man becomes the master of the world. He pillages the earth. He cuts down the sacred forest. He loses his way. Sadly, this feels like all present. What of the future? What was once profusion becomes a wasteland. The king is sick from a wound that will not heal. The only way to cure a king and save the land is to find a grail, the feminine symbol of wildness and harmony to find again a oneness with nature. This was my Jungian interpretation of the myth. And probably the most interesting character, who is a character we see often in uh, John Berman's uh, films, is the character of Merlin. Uh, Merlin appears in Zardos as the character of Artifrain. He may appear in point blank as the the men are giving uh, instructions, informations to Lee Marvin to, to defeat the uh, criminal mobs organization. For a century now, we have been rushing headlong into the future. We have made a cult out of progress and we have forgotten our former selves, our former patterns of behavior, whose origins can be traced to the Middle Ages. We no, long, no longer have roots and today, in particular, when we are contemplate the possible destruction of our planet, there is a pressing need to investigate the matter of Britain. Excalibur today, strangely enough, is forgotten by new generations addicted by Games of Thrones of other uh, Eric fantasy uh, fiction television. It's to forget that Excalibur has um, you know, an extraordinary uh, casting. You have um, the beginning career of actors such like uh, Lang Neeson, Gabriel Byrne, um, and Patrick Stewart. And of course, you have a very sensual as Morgan Helen Mirren. What are you afraid of? I don't know. Shall I tell you what's out there? Yes, please. The dragon, a beast of such power that if you were to see it whole and all complete in a single glance, it would burn you to cinders. Where is it? It is everywhere. It is everything. Its scales glisten in the bark of trees. Its roar is heard in the wind and its forked tongue strikes like... like... Oh, like lightning. Yes, that's it. 
How can I? What, what shall I? Must, must I? Oh, do nothing. Be still. Sleep. Rest in the arms of the dragon. Dream. Why John Borman is a filmmaker to see today? Every film of John Borman is different. It is a new adventure. Science fiction in Zardos, Medieval Times in Excalibur. Like Stanley Kubrick, in a way, each of his films, he wants to discover a new territory. The hero quest, the hero's journey, is one of the most important themes. The hero has to be confronted to obstacles, crossing landscapes, having adventures, the physical journey becoming a mental one. Like Terence Malick and Jane Campion, he is one of the greatest painters of nature and cinema. His films are wonderful about fire, water, earth, the sea. They have cosmic values. John Borman succeeds using realism to reach something behind the reality, the fantasy. He is in a certain way, in the long tradition of popular cinema, Harold Flynn, adventurous, popular spectacle film. It's alive, it's entertaining, but it has always a message for the viewers. A man of imagination, close to Carl Gustav Jung, archetype where the unconscious collective has a big part. His violence is never pornographic. A violence here has a meaning in transforming the characters. John Borman is a total filmmaker. A filmmaker could do a film about his childhood, like in Hope and Glory, a western like Deliverance, or revolutionize completely a genre like the film noir, the thriller, the American thriller in Point Blank. His style, his editing, the way he directs actors make a unique, oniric, poetic filmmaker. I want to share with you. This was Dr. T, and I hope to see you very soon. Thank you to see this.